welcome. Welcome everybody to the Waterfront Environmental Annual Meeting. We're very excited you can all join us today. We're gonna have great speakers and we're gonna have some great fun. But most of all, whenever you see the words, we care for Lake Sinclair, you gotta give a round of applause. So the best thing about this is that we're in a beautiful uh, Blossom Heath Beach House today. I, I think the TIFA group as well as council has done a great job out here. This is a great venue for this. If we anticipated having more people, we could have opened up the doors and just moved out a little bit. But uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun here today and just learning about the programs that we've uh, been working on with St. Clair Shores Waterfront Environmental Committee. So with, without any ado, I would like to do the Pledge of Allegiance, please, if you don't mind standing. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. And very, very important that every uh, meeting that we have, we always recite the water environmental, uh, our mission statement. And our mission statement is the St. Clair Shores Waterfront Environmental Committee is committed to the conservation, protection, and safe use of Lake St. Clair for current and future generations. So, and we want to give a special reach out to the younger folks. We got some people on the committee. Uh, we have some people joining us from college, from high school. So uh, again, they're the, you know, the lifeblood of the community, the lifeblood of our uh, committee. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, now I have my little remote control here. So it's very important for us to just mention our first little thing. Where'd it go? There it is. There we go. Look at this guy. All right. Way to go, J Joe St. John. He's joined us here. So Joe's taught me a long time ago the main reason why we're here is outreach to the community. And he's been a great uh, uh, teacher for us all, as well as coming with us to various schools as we provide uh, various opportunities where we'll read comic books to them, re we'll review, uh, review Lake uh, protocols, uh, talk about clean lake procedures, and again, thanks Joe, we understand you, so, all right. And now we're gonna move on to our contributors list with Aaron. Thank you. Does it work? It does now. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just tell you next slide or whatever. Okay. I guess I can speak into this one, right? All right, we'll do that and we'll save that for someone else. Um, okay, so I'd like to start with uh, start the committee treasurer report by acknowledging our contributors. Um, today you hear a lot about all of the committee projects that are only possible because of the generous donations of time, skills, money, and dedication from our committee members, who I believe will be introducing them around a little bit later. And also, uh, the dedication from our volunteers, teachers, students, parents, homeowners, and residents, who you will see throughout all of these different presentations of our projects of 2020. On the screen is a list of contributors whose generous donations of goods and services enhanced our ability to make a difference. Um, the We Are Here Foundation, Tom Cleaver, the Jefferson Yacht Club, Representative, oh, I'll, I'll get to them in just a second, um, GFL, Advanced Aquatics Dive, um, Dive Shop, the City of St. Clair Shores, IBM Corporation, MDOT, Macomb County DPW, and those who have contributed $500 each to our student scholarship winners, who are uh, State Representative Kevin Hertal, Dan and Anthony Corvair, the St. Clair Shores Lions, Lock St. Clair Kiwanis. Uh, yes. <laughs> so if, oh, I was able to do the clicker, yay. <laughs> 
All right, so all of their contributions have allowed us to continue our rain barrel program, which brought in, you can see from the first line there, brought in uh, over $3,000 worth of revenue. And there's also a carryover of almost $1,300 from a corporate grant for the kayak giveaway program this year. So before the pandemic hit in March, we were able to print our educational coloring books and share them with many groups and students. And that shows in the expense column. So in 2020, the St. Clair Shores Waterfront Environmental Committee had a total of $6,148.20 in revenues, $5,864.25 in expenses, and that left us a balance of $10,557.74 for 2021 to expand our projects and the positive impact our projects have on the community and the environment. So for our committee and resource members, our volunteers and generous contributors, can we give them another round, a thank you round of applause? Thank you, guys. Oh, you clicked it already. Sorry. <laughs> um, yay. All right, perfect. So next on the agenda that you have on your desk is um, the I-94 ramps only cleanup. So as the team coordinator of this pro program, I'm happy to announce that 2020 marked our 16th year. We started off in 20 or 2004, just picking up trash. And you can see from, our, we did get a picture here, and we were the Waterfront Advisory Committee at one point in time. <laughs> Thanks to Joe St. John, we put the environmental in there. <laughs> um, but we started picking up trash and then expanded the project to be beautifying the entrances to our community by adding flower beds on the bridges and cutting the tall grass at the corners. Um, these next two slides, uh, the red lines show the areas where we actually clean. You can see it's just like an eight, uh, around the H pattern of I-94. Uh, we meet the second Saturday of the month, and the first cleanup of, of 2021 is May 8th. And let's see, we meet in this parking lot at 10 Mile and I-94. It's the northeast corner, and uh, we start we start at 10 and go until noon. So if you'd like to join us there. Uh, and this slide just shows uh, at 11 mile and 12 mile, the areas that we clean. And a lot of people might wonder, why would the St. Clair Shores Waterfront Environmental Committee support a project so far from the lake? All of these corners, there's little drains right at those corners. So when people drive up there, and they stop at the light, they have a, tenden a horrible tendency to drop off trash right there, right where those drains are. Those drains flow directly into Lake St. Clair, and we pick up, we've, we've picked up over 1,000 bags of trash that have, could have potentially found its way to polluting the lake. So I have <laughs> the honor and privilege of sharing the story of our dedicated volunteer or dedicated project volunteers in 2020. So, um, yeah, the story of them all. Uh, due to Governor Whitmer's orders prohibiting landscapers uh, to work outside, we had to for, uh, cancel our May and June cleanups. But then in July, August, September, October, our volunteers kicked it into high gear, staying safe and social distancing um, out in the fresh air. Um, it seemed... Uh, well, and good thing that we did do that because it seemed that during the stay-at-home order, people were driving around more and throwing more of their trash out of the car windows. So, and I, I wanted to give kudos uh, to our dedicated 2020 volunteers, um, Councilman Vitali, Julia, Barbara, Jay, Bob, Micheline, Sarah, uh, Cal, Linda and Jim, uh, Mom and daughter, Christine and Samantha, and also Joe, for your support coming out the one day. Um, 
yeah, without our dedicated volunteers, uh, we just wouldn't have had the success that we had this year. And I want to point out, the, on this side over here, uh, we take a look at certain uh, key goals, the day, number of days that we do, the bags that, pick, that we pick up, and the number of volunteers. And you can see from 2015 to 2020, we had uh, two less days to clean up, 10 less volunteers, but we cleaned up, you know, each volunteer cleaned up three bags of trash. So it was just an absolute incredible time, and kudos to Julia, Barbara, Jay, and, um, and Micheline, the very last day, they stayed an extra two hours and cleaned up nine miles so that it was uh, pristine <laughs> for a while into the winter months. So again, thank you so much. Um, 2021, let's go. <laughs> we care, we yeah, like St. Clair. <laughs>Groovelover is going to say something about our social networking. Here. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Mike Drugleaver. Uh, speaking for Eric, who could not make it here in today, our social media director. Um, anyway, next slide coming up here. I just want to talk about and encourage folks to check out our social media sites uh, here on Facebook. Um, Facebook, if you, I mean, if you search for Lake St. Clair Environmental Committee, you'll find it. Uh, the handle is S-E-S-W-E-C. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the abbreviation, of course. Um, and there we, have, we organize uh, the events and we make announcements, and whatnot, obviously here on social media. Um, one thing we wanted to mention, uh, not up here, is one thing we started last year was uh, creating an Eventbrite account. And so in Eventbrite, uh, again, if you just search for the committee, you can find us there. Uh, last year we used it for the first time uh, for, the, the, for the cleanup. It was a huge success, and uh, we look forward to expanding that. Uh, um, with all the other events. So again, check out our social media, Facebook, and, uh, and uh, Eventbrite. Thanks. All right. Now we're going to have talk about our kayak program. And we, this is our newest member, Corey Champagne. She's been awesome. Thank you. All right, um, so good afternoon, everyone. The St. Clair Shores Waterfront Environmental Committee, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, we award several kayaks per year to students who submit applications and who complete the required volunteer work um, on projects with our, for, with our committee throughout the year. Uh, this year, we have three winners, uh, two of which who were not able to make it today, one of which who is here. Um, so the before I announce the winner that's here today, uh, the kayaks will be awarded or gifted at the Nautical Coast Cleanup this year at 8.30 in the morning uh, before we get started. But for our winner today, uh, we have Jake Cardenas. Congratulations, Jake. Um, and so this year we look forward to um, continuing this program into, uh, into the upcoming year and I look forward to working with all of our schools, our donors, and of course our amazing committee mem members in um, keeping this program alive and thriving. Just a side note, uh, Christian Duran got the IBM grant for the kayaks, so it's a uh, uh, He's got some personal things going on, so he was going to uh, kind of step down from the committee a little bit, but we still have like $1,200 dedicated to the kayak. So Corey decided, you know, she j jumped right up there and is talking to the principals. She's going to get out there and start talking to the students, and uh, we're going to have another three kayaks uh, next year. So it's a great program for the lake, so thank you. Yeah. And? And she could stay up there right now because she's going to talk about the stenciling program with Gail Asburn from South Lake School. And Mike did some work there too. And Jake Cavalier. I like that name. Good. Okay, so uh, storm drain stenciling is important because if you do not know, all of the storm drains drain directly into Lake St. Clair. And so all of the garbage, 
waste, car soap, whatever it is that is going down your driveway or down the drain when it rains goes directly into the lake. So, and many people don't know that. So uh, my students and many other uh, groups go out into the community and storm drain stencil. So great program that Joe created. And so you, it's a simple process and plus kids get spray paint, so it's a joy. Uh, green goes first, you have a little model of how it goes. Then the white goes over the top, it's beautiful. Kids of all ages can do it. We don't really recommend babies do it because, you know, again, spray paint, and that could be messy. Uh, my students love to go out and go up and we just go in a kind of like a grid, go up and down the streets behind our school, do all the um, drains in the school parking lot also because there's drains everywhere in the school parking lot. Um, and it builds awareness with my students and the community because as we're stenciling the drains, we put hangers, placards on everybody's door to explain, hey, we're stenciling your drains, and here's why, because all of the drains go right to the lake. And um, I don't know, I think it just kind of builds some uh, awareness of our committee and what we do. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so looking ahead for this year, uh, we will be planning a one or two, a two day event with a local Eagle, Eagle Scouts troop um, where they're going to go out and they're going to update the uh, stencils that need to be updated within a couple of blocks. Um, so we're planning that out right now. Um, and then following that, I hope to plan several other events this year. Um, our ultimate goal is to build out a sustainable volunteer and uh, mapping system to ensure quality and timely upgrades to our drain systems over year over year. Um, it's an honor to adopt this program from Joe St. Clair, so thank you for putting your trust in us to get this done. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, carrying this forward with success and much enthusiasm. Now we're going to have Mike Drew Glover come up again. Here he is about the lake. And we're going to have Jessica Schneider come up. We got pictures of her in here today. She's, gonna, she's been in many cleanups, a former scholarship winner. So thanks for coming up. Take it away. Okay, thanks. You got the shirt from one not? Or are we looking at this? Yeah. There's okay. Jessica Good. right there. Okay, hey, thanks again. Uh, 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 lake lovers, right? I'm sure I'm, everyone here is, loves the lake. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be here. Uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, I love telling the story. I got uh, stationed here several years ago with, with the Marines over here at Selfridge. I thought I would do my three years and go, but uh, there were a lot of things I loved about the community. Big one was, was the lake. And I, I, and frankly, it's a good, it's a pretty big reason why I'm now a resident of St. Clair Shores. Um, so I love telling that story. I'm out of towner, but uh, uh, I'm more or less your neighbor from here on out. Uh, so, hi, uh, again, I'm Mike Drugleber. Um, I, I had the privilege this year, this, this is the second year that I get to be the event director uh, for the annual Coast Cleanup. Uh, if you were not aware, several years, almost 30 years ago, uh, this committee was started to do the cleanup, thanks to Joe St. John. Really appreciates uh, all, all the work all those years, uh, Joe, and especially allowing me the, the privilege to uh, take over uh, for better or for worse. But, uh, you know, for, for, but of course, what happened last year being the first year, uh, what happened? We, we had the, the restrictions come down. Uh, so what, what a way to get uh, for a transition for me to take over. But, uh, you know what, uh, as the Marines, we, we always say, uh, you know, always uh, flexible uh, in one way or another. Um, and if anything, I enjoyed the challenge. Uh, and as, you're, as, as many of you may be aware, instead of doing it in May, uh, we did it at the end of the summer. Um, and so uh, we had a restricted uh, participation, uh, but I'm glad to, to report that from last year, uh, we still maxed out that participation. We made the best of it. And uh, I think that was a very important point that uh, regardless of the, of the situation, we make the best of it and continue the tradition. And so, uh, so again, we have about 100 people show up last year, it was about in September. I'm glad to do it again, back to our usual time here in May. Uh, you, know, after, you know, we're defrosting from the winter time and something we like to look forward to uh, it's, is getting outside and, and uh, enjoy the, the warm weather and of course the lake. And so May is always 
been a fitting time to do this. Also, another, another thing that uh, is fitting for May is uh, all the debris and uh, whatnot from the, the winter times come down and, and the beaches aren't, aren't used as much, and so there's a lot to clean up, and so it's, it's very appropriate for, uh, for us to do it in May, so we're glad to do, go back to that original dates. Um, so last year, uh, again, not as many uh, uh, dumpsters and uh, as trash that we had to, to pick up. Um, uh, we had the many beach cleanups and, of course, the participation just from our, from our residents throughout the, the summer to help clean up. Um, and uh, so we only had about two, two uh, dumpsters. Uh, you, typically, we have around four dumpsters. Uh, that equated about 12 tons. So that's about a third of what we usually collect. Uh, regardless, still a significant uh, uh, cleanup. Um, uh, despite the situations. Uh, 100 people uh, maxed out participation. Typically we have about 400 and we look forward to building those numbers up here again. Um, one thing I'd like to share from last year, despite the challenges, it did force us to change some of our ways, uh, modernize some of our practices. Previously in the, in the slide, I mentioned that we started our Eventbrite um, channel, if you will, and again, huge success there, much easier way to keep track of our, our volunteers and invite them back and encourage them to come back in following years, and of course, uh, some of the other uh, uh, events that we, uh, we have. So again, continue seeing us to build that site and uh, announce more events and get more participation, because that's what we're all about, right? We mentioned it earlier, um, it's all about getting out to the community, and this is what we do, right? We bring everybody together, do good things, generate awareness for uh, good causes. Okay, next page. All right, um, let me see. So uh, this is the third slide. Um, so just want to conclude that I want to encourage everyone to get out there. So in one month, so it's, all, it's always on a Sunday, and, you know, for as long as I've been doing this, it's been great weather. Right? And I'm pretty sure we're going to have great weather this Sunday, uh, the 23rd, once again. Um, so um, continue building these numbers up. Continue spreading the good word. Uh, 807 tons. We just broke the 800 uh, ton marker here um, uh, this, this past year, and we'll keep on building that. Um, and again, Eventbrite uh, and also Facebook. Those are the two places that you can get the information. Again, just search for the committee. Search for the cleanup here in St. Clair Stores. You'll, you'll find it. Um, I don't think there's any competing efforts, so it'll pop up in the, in the search engine there. So uh, put it on your calendar. One month from now, Sunday, in addition to the cleanup, we have breakfast for you. We'll have uh, lunch, hot dogs and hamburgers and whatnot, and a few speakers as well. Uh, again, it's going to be a beautiful day. Uh, hold me to it. Okay. Look, everyone, I uh, hope to see you there. Again, isn't this a beautiful facility? I love this place. It's got so much. It's nice and warm in here. Uh, there's many uses for this place. Uh, we might even try to meet here as a committee if we could. So we appreciate it. So now there's a very important uh, topic going to be coming up now. And Mr. Rebello is going to talk about some of the green initiatives that we've been working on. Well, hello, hello. Thank you. Um, I was going to here wait till Joe gets. I'm going to just take a little small time out here. I'm Dave Rebello. Uh, Joe St. John uh, got me involved with this a long time ago. And uh, it was a pleasure to have somebody like him as a teacher, as a role model. Um, for a number of years, I was a coordinator with Nautical Coast Cleanup. Mike Drew Gleaver took over from me. Doing a great job, Mike. Okay? Awesome. So I just wanted to uh, bear with me a second. Wanted to take a time out and just say some thanks. I got uh, Bill Gamble back there. Bill Gamble, give us a wave. Assistant city manager, thanks for coming. Okay. I like having the school people here. Uh, superintendent, the super down the way, Carl Paulson from Lakeview High School. Gail Ashburn, she's on our committee doing some great work for us. Thanks for, for getting involved with the school. Is there any other school people here that I might not know or? Okay. Lisa, Lisa Beckman, right? Lisa Beckman, thanks for coming, okay? Some guys here, I wanted, to, I wanted to have them stand up. Stand up for the folks that I just called out, okay? Go on, stand up. Okay, okay, they're not gonna stand up, that's okay. I wanted to give a shout out here. There's a couple of folks back here that make the city click, has made St. Clair Shores better for all of us. 
uh, Councilman Ron Frederick. Are you there you are. Okay. <laughs> Councilman John Karen. Thanks for your guys' work. DPW Director Brian Babcock. Brian, you guys help us out a ton, that's for sure. And there's our Parks and Recreation Department guy, Henry Bowman. Henry, thanks for all you've been doing in our city. Okay. Now, I normally don't do this, and I'm going to let Joe sit down for a second here. And I don't mean to embarrass him, but I want you all to stand up and give this guy a big hand, because without Joe, Joe's our emeritus, okay? And Joe created this whole thing, and Joe, this is why we're all here, and this is your legacy, okay? So please give Joe a hand, okay? I can't tell you, I can't tell you how much I learned from Joe, and thanks for being a friend, okay? You always have it. You're always with us. Okay, and now I just wanted to talk about some, some things here we've been doing over the past years. Joe has always stressed education in the community about these causes that are causing our lake to misfunction sometimes. That's for sure. So we all have been involved with this. You can see all the tons that we've pulled out of the lake. This has all taken great volunteers from everybody in this room. And it's been 800 and was it 807 tons? That's a lot of tons of garbage out of that lake, okay? So, Peter, you've been involved with this stuff a long time too. And thank you for all the work you've done, okay? So let me move on. The kiosk program. We sat around one day and figured out how can we educate the community a little bit better, okay? And basically, <laughs> this idea was a total ripoff from a park in Traverse City, okay? So you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Because every time I'd go to Traverse City down on the water, um, I'd see signs like this. Because they, I thought, always did a nice job with it. So they had, I think, a Grand Traverse watershed. And I was looking at the map and I go, darn it, now that's a good idea. So I called up a little, there was a little marker on the bottom I said, how did you guys do that? I think I called the Chamber of Commerce. And they explained it to me, gave me all the contacts. This is our Lake St. Clair sports fish, but we also have over here the Lake St. Clair watershed. So we changed the map around, we got some new figures. Voila, we came up with a kiosk. Now this, I think, is an educational thing. This has been down at, we put one at the Blossom Heath Pier. Down that way, there's one sitting down there. There's also one sitting at the Veterans Park at Masonic and Jefferson. And Mark Horderick here, Mark, there, he's here today, helped me out. We designed this whole thing. And it's a great educational tool because there's times where I'm sitting down at the lake at Veterans Memorial Park, and I see people come up and they read these types of things. So this is a lesson in our Lake St. Clair watershed. Then a couple of years or two passed, we said, what else can we do to educate the people? And we said, Lake St. Clair sports fish, okay? So we made another one. We put this one at Vets Park at Masonic and Jefferson, and there's one sitting down there at the... Uh, here down here. So we see people read it, they educate themselves. These are the ones at the pier right down there. So that was just our little way of saying, hey, this is what's going on around you. Because there's plenty of times people look out at that lake and they, they don't have a, a clue sometimes of really how it all works. So the watershed, the Lake St. Clair fish, those were two great ideas, I thought. So what else can we do? There was another one, okay? So now we're gonna start working on uh, some of the things here about greenery in St. Clair Shores and how that works. And we're gonna educate people along that lines. So we plan on some more kiosks coming along the way. So we're alive and we're doing well. 30 years into it, thank you, Joe St. John, okay? 
Thank you. And kind of what Dave was also alluding to a little bit is, uh, in, 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 a, in a moment I'm going to be asking uh, a couple of our big hitters for the, the, the show today, the show, the meeting today. But uh, Sharon, uh, Corey, as well as uh, Sarah Schultz, they've been both working hard on green infrastructure. And, and they brought an idea to us that we're going to be talking about a little bit more. Uh, th there's green infrastructure and green initiatives are really important, especially to St. Clair Shores, because all the water comes through St. Clair Shores many times before it goes either down Jefferson or to the lake. So th there's, there's many other cities that are claiming, oh, they have green infrastructure. Oh, they have this, they have that. But today you're going to see a lot of the different things as well as there's a registry that we're going to be uh, participating in working with Dave and Sharon to get uh, the projects that we're doing and a lot of the other projects in St. Clair Shores on it because we got a lot to be proud of. So we'll be excited about that. So uh, now I'm going to ask Sarah to come on up first. She's going to talk about the beach cleanup. Then she's going to roll right into the green infrastructure. Great program. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, my, yeah, my name is Sarah Schultz. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, our mini beach cleanups. Um, after doing the nautical coast cleanup for a couple of years, I had come back to the beaches you know, a couple months later and noticed that there was a lot of debris building up already. So um, the committee started, we're just doing twice a year, um, some smaller cleanups just to supplement the nautical coast cleanup. And um, we also have an Earth Day cleanup that we do every year. Uh, that one is this Sunday, April 25th. We meet right here at Blossom Heath at 10 a.m. Um, so if you, we were interested in any of those dates, um, you don't have to sign up ahead. You can just come meet here. Uh, and we'll, we'll do kind of like a smaller scale cleanup for those. So. And then the next is July 11 and then September 12th. Okay, so um, I'm also going to talk about um, some rain gardens and native plants. Um, the question is, why are we talking about these things um, in regard to the water quality of the lake? So um, we're kind of going to address that as we go through. There are a lot of different reasons why we can put in these things and that helps protect the lake. And I'm hoping to help install more of these in the future and in, in the city. So rain garden is a depressed area in the landscape that is built to collect rain, rain water and slow down the runoff so that it drains slowly instead of running right into the lake. Um, and it can also help filtrate the water. Um, so this bottom picture, oh, sorry, you can go back. The bottom picture here is a rain garden and it doesn't always look like that. This is right after the rain so the water will sit there for a little while um, and then slowly drain, drain out. And then top picture is, um, let's see, we have, this kind of shows the size of our root system, which is an important part of the rain garden. This is regular grass here. So it's, water goes through it very, very quickly. And native, if we use native plants, we have a much deeper root system. So the plants in here um, have that deeper root system that helps with the filtration. Okay, you can go to the next one. <laughs> All right, so why would we want to use native plants? Um, the first reason is we can, by doing that, we provide habitat, which is food and shelter for pollinators. Pollinators are bees, butterflies, animals that help pollinate the native plants. Um, Native plants also have evolved to live here. So once they are established, they require minimal work. Um, they can tolerate a range of um, soil moisture levels. So from very, very wet to very dry, they can tol many of them can tolerate clay soils as well. They have that expansive root system. So that helps slow down the flow of the water. And also just putting in a rain garden instead of just a ditch enhances the um, 
beauty and it increases the interest. So it's nicer to look at. And then I'm going to turn it over to Sharon for the, the next part. Thank you. So every little bit helps if we um, switch over to native plants and help any way that we can to slow the water from getting into the storm system, filtrate the water before it gets to the so rain, to the storm drains. Um, because as it's been pointed out, everything goes right straight to the lake. So we want to protect our lake. That's the critical issue and the reason that we're here. Um, so it, you can start out really small, um, like some of us are trying to get rid of their lawn altogether, but you don't have to do that. You can start with just a small area. Um, this picture is just a small area next to my porch, and it was just, okay, let's put in some native plants there. Um, for $20, you can have a pretty good start on a nice little rain garden, or I'm sorry, on a nice little butterfly garden. Um, I have order forms over there for the Yardeners of St. Clair Shores. They're a great organization. They have a native plant sale every year. Um, they just do a great job and you can trust that their plants are native. So that's one of the things that I learned is that you really want to watch your source. And just because you go to your local lawn and garden store and it says native, it's native to somewhere, but that doesn't mean it's native to here. So you need to be careful what you're doing if you're trying to go uh, native. Um, you, just, you can put in just a few native plants in your regular flower beds just to help the butterflies and the bees and um, I can't tell you how much enjoyment I've gotten just from seeing all the pollinators that come. Um, so you can, you can go on. So this is a picture of my rain garden um, in my yard. Um, so you can, it can help with, in St. Clair Shores, I know a lot of us have a lot of issues with water pooling in the backyards. Um, it really helps a lot to have this. It's um, reduced our water um, pooling other than in the rain garden, which is gone within 48 hours. We do sometimes still have an area in front of that when during heavy rains. Um, but when I've been comparing it and I've been doing kind of a little study with neighbors who have tried different techniques to get rid of um, the pooling in their yard, ours is drained within about 24 hours generally and theirs isn't. So it, it's a helpful tool. It is just one tool. Um, there are other ways to do it, but that is one uh, helpful tool using the native plants. Um, if you do it so that um, you put it in, um, where the water is coming out of the gutters and the um, downspouts, you're going to protect that water from going straight into the sewer, sewer drains, um, the storm drains, I'm sorry. So just a quick, quick, I mean this is very basic, how to uh, do your rain garden, you start with a plan, you do a perk test to see um, how much drainage you have, how slowly or fast it drains, um, which also helps you. You want to get rid of your grass. This is how we chose in our yard to get rid of the grass. Uh, we started this in the fall before. Um, not all of that is rain garden, but that is now all a native plant area. Um, so, and then here comes the fun stuff. You get to dig um, or hire somebody else who is younger and stronger. Um, my husband and I did this. This is our rain garden. This is solid clay. We were sliding in the bottom of it. Um, so we did amend our soil. Um, this one is a school playground that I consulted on. Uh, they had their downspouts going into this. And then they did perforated drain tile throughout. Um, and they amended their soil, but they didn't do as much because as you can see, this is sand. So sand drains much better. Um, but they had a lot of water problems in their school playground, and she tells me that the water problems are solved. So these were both done last year. This is beginning stages of plantings. Um, she still had her trees to put in. I had a lot more to put in. Um, so I'm hoping that this year they're going to be very large, all the plants, and looking beautiful. Um, that one backs up. That's my yard. It backs up to Princeton Elementary. 
And if anybody, because this is so basic and it doesn't teach you anything about the rain gardens or how to do it, but if anybody has any questions, just email me at this rain gardens for all at gmail.com and I'm happy to share resources. I'm happy to come out and look at your site. Um, whatever you would like, just feel free to ask, okay? Thank you. Something else that's coming up, actually brand new from uh, council at the last council meeting. Uh, Mayor Kip Wabi so, told me he couldn't come tonight, he had another engagement, but he, he did tell me to mention that there's a, there's a new St. Clair Shore stormwater ordinance that's out. Uh, primarily, I'm probably gonna butcher it a little bit, but uh, primarily what the city was always getting money from a set rate from a lot of people's yards. But then there, it was, it's just in the Sentinel paper where we, we won't be allowed to do that anymore and there has to be a charge per square foot of land that you owned. Uh, so that's something important that they're gonna have to, uh, everybody in St. Clair Shore is gonna have to pay for that. But, and we need the money, don't get me wrong, it's important to get the money for, for projects along Jefferson, big pumps that are going in, but this is, it could be a little bit of a competition because if you have a rain garden in your, in your neighbor, in your backyard, or in your house, you can go in and petition to the city and explain that. Maybe you have to do a perk test because who knows if your, your lawn is made of clay or soil or if it's gonna soak in. But you can have rain gardens and you should be able to go back and say, hey, half of my yard is a rain garden or half of my downspouts are going to my garden. They're not going out to the street or, or likewise. And you should be able to get credit for that from the city. So these are programs that are going on in many other com uh, communities around the country. City of Detroit does it too. If you want to say that you have impervious areas, you're going to get charged. But if you're able to put filters in the ground, let the groundwater filter into the ground, you can get credits for that and get a break on that tax. So that's kind of where we're at. So. And I also need to mention a couple other people out here that uh, very important that we got here. I know Councilman Rusi, uh, she sent me an email saying that she was under the weather and couldn't attend. But also, you know, we forget, I forgot to mention, thanks for St. Clair Shores video. Uh, you guys are, TV are the best. They came out here, no problem. Mary Jane said, yeah, we'll just have them come on out and film it out here. And these programs are just so important, we can get it out to the community. So now we're gonna have a guest speaker coming up here who is Cheryl English. Hey, all right. We want to get a little variety. I know we're going to have a couple of discussions from uh, Lakeview Schools as well as the DPW, but we wanted to show another angle on watersheds. And Sharon was instrumental lining you up, Cheryl. Thank you so much because you have a really cool way of handling plants. So tell us about it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've been involved with native plants for the better part of 20 years now. I moved into my house on the east side of Detroit back in 1995, and I started gardening relatively typically. I tore all the grass out, so that's not typical, but um, hostas and daylilies, et cetera, and I dipped my toe into the native plant habitat concept very, very lightly. And now most of my yard, uh, it's, a, it's a typical urban lot, uh, I live in the city of Detroit, uh, is, is basically habitat. In fact, I tore up the last of the grass last year and I'm putting in, um, I'm basically doing permaculture for wildlife. Um, and Sharon and, I don't, uh, what was? Okay, you, you mentioned pollinators, and the thing is, we think about bees and butterflies and moths as pollinators, bees are probably the most effective. Um, but things like wasps and flies are also pollinators. So what I'm trying to do in my yard, that I, and I open it up to the public twice a year, to the public free of charge, uh, and uh, you can come see what an urban yard can look like, a habitat can look like in a, a city um, to, show, you know, to, to, to show what you can do to create the space that is welcoming to everyone. Um, you were talking about the conditions here in St. Clair Shores. You are part of what is called Lake Plain Prairie. This is actually the most endangered habitat on the planet because it is the most conducive to human habitation. It's coastal, 
which we gravitate to that historically because it's access historically before we had things like cars and planes and trains, we got around by going on the water. So that is where we settled. And we spread out from there. This is a typic the typical context is you have what we call vernal pooling, which means spring inundation, which is what you're talking about with rain gardens, Sharon. Um, Belle Isle is typical of this habitat. There's a small park on the east side of Detroit called Balduck Park, which is about two miles from my house. There's an area there that has not been developed. It's called the Aspen Trail, which has exactly the same circumstances, vernal pooling, drying down to very dry conditions later in the season. Um, and the plant profile is very similar in both Balduck and on Belle Isle. Um, and I was actually down at Rouge Park a couple weeks ago. We have a similar context there. Native plants are critical to our survival on the planet, period. We are utterly dependent on the functioning of the planet for our survival. If the planetary system fails, we will fail as a species, and we are the major contributor to that failure. And one of the best ways that we can use to mitigate what we've been doing is by starting to plant more and more native plants, as Sharon was describing. And this plant list is fantastic. In fact, my friend Michelle Saren is the person who puts this together. She's no longer living in St. Clair Shores, but she's still active with the Yardeners. And there's great plants on this list. And I have a couple pictures of them. Um, the um, Lobelia, that's Lobelia cardinalis, it's cardinal flower. Uh, beautiful red flower that is attractive to hummingbirds, also pollinators. Um, the uh, swamp um, milkweed, trying to change the common name to that to rosy milkweed. It's kind of hard to sell people on things with plants that have common names with words like swamp and weed and snake and rot, you know. It's, it's a tough sell. Spiderwort, great plant. Oh no, I don't want that. You know, it's a really critical pollinator plant, but try to sell someone that, something that says snake root or, you know, it's tough. So we're going to start calling it rosy milkweed instead of swamp milkweed. You don't have to have a swamp to have swamp milkweed. It's the perfect plant for an area where you have heavy clay soil inundation in the spring. Um, and you know, a lot of people despair about having clay. I have heavy clay. Yes, southeastern Michigan has heavy clay. And there are plants that evolve to deal with that successfully. And one of the best plants that you can use is something called cup plant that will cut through heavy clay like a hot knife through butter. And it'll, roots will go down 12, 15 feet into the soil. And my friend Don, who does these beautiful photographs for me, and my, these, are, these are all, he, he, he's been photographing my yard for over a decade. Um, and I've worked with over 200 species of native plants on my property. Um, it's not big, it's a typical urban lot, as I said. Um, we joke about the cup plant, you know, in really bad drought years, you know, it's, it's so sad, it's only nine and a half feet tall. It's just tragic how it suffers. Um, there's a, there are great plants out there, and there are great print resources as well that I would like to recommend. Um, Doug Tallamy, his uh, book, Bringing Nature Home, is a great introduction to some of the ideas that Sharon touched on with what we're doing with rain guards about creating habitat and being welcoming to those species that help keep the planetary system going for our health. And he's got a new book that came out last year called Nature's Best Hope. And this is a great concept. And what he's talking about is creating the homegrown national park. And you can get your home, you start, you start adding the plants the way Sharon was talking about, and creating a habitat that's welcoming because if you have the bees and the butterflies and the moths and the wasps and you know you, you'll get the birds i saved a possum from the middle of outer drive a couple weeks ago actually two weeks ago today um, who was suffering because of the drought if there's a drought out there it's affecting everything out there and this possum was suffering from dehydration because of the drought um, these are all integral parts of the system that make it function. They're critical. You know, I don't know if you know about possums. They aren't rabies vectors. Their body temperatures are too low. They eat ticks. They're actually contributors to rodent control. So please don't use rodenticides, because when you use rodenticides, you're not just killing the target organism. You're killing everything that would be trying to help you with that target organism. 
Um, and he's talking about creating this, this national park that can be larger than the top 10 national parks in the country in terms of area, just by converting urban, suburban, and exurban yards into habitat. Um, there's a great books on gardening for birds. There's just so much you can do. And since I've started gardening with native plants, every year that I am in my property, the number and quantity, the number and diversity, I'm sorry, the number and diversity of species that I see using my yard in terms of insects, birds, other wildlife, every year it's greater and it's more fascinating and it's more beautiful. Um, and I, it's just, I've, it's created a whole new level of experience for me as a homeowner. Um, nothing occurs in isolation in nature. Everything is interconnected. Nothing is discrete. There are ripple effects for everything that we can do. And if we can do some positive things, we can create some positive ripples. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. We appreciate you coming and talking about your plants. Matter of fact, we'd like to get some pictures of those and we'll put them in with our PowerPoint presentation if you, if you can. I have to be careful because I don't own copyright to them. Oh, okay. But I can talk well, to them. Take some I videos. Great. Someone's cleaning the mic, but that's okay. Uh, and we're kind of continuation with our green infrastructure, with our rain gardens, which with, with all this stuff, matter of fact, uh, Sharon's gonna come up and talk about Kite Monroe here, about what she's been doing with Henry, uh, Henry Bowman to come up with ideas on how we can work and put better plants in at Kite Monroe. Oh. <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay, so Kite Monroe has this amazing, amazing area, um, which I knew nothing about. So um, when I found out about it, I'm so geeked and so happy about this. So in the north parking lot on Kite, of Kite Monroe, there is impervious, or there is pervious pavers, and there is like 3,000 square feet of bioswale. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been maintained, so um, the plan is very soon, I'm gathering the plants for it, um, very soon is to have that uh, phase one of the restoration of the bioswale um, completed. Uh, we will put it on our calendar, and when we um, are ready to have a planting day, we will be looking for volunteers to help with that. But I am just so excited to, because it's such a great program, such a great project, and I am thrilled that we actually have that. So it, it's gonna be really beautiful when we're done with it, so. Right. Thanks, Sharon. We are gonna have uh, Lakeview Schools come up next. While they're coming up, we're gonna, just, a, just another little thing, Henry's really been vigil. He's doing great in the city. There's so many projects he's got implementing. Uh, and when we, Sharon put a plant list together and gave it to him and he reviewed it with people and making sure they're gonna work and he's, he's even gonna cultivate it. They're gonna clean it up a little bit and it's gonna work out really well. So. Uh, now I, I have Lisa Beckman from Lakeview Schools to talk about some of the, the things that she's doing at her school because again, it's so key with the students, get the teachers, getting the students going and the parents going. So go take it over. All right, well, like, I, like you said, I'm Lisa Beckman and I'm, I'm a teacher at Jefferson Middle School. And about 12 years ago, we started our JMS Community Giving Garden. Um, it was kind of a, my teaching partner and I we had this idea that we wanted to be able to give back to the community. And unfortunately, uh, one of our former students uh, became an Eagle Scout 
and he came back to us. He was in our project science class at one time, and he came back and he said, I want to do something, I want to give back, and he was trying to figure out what he wanted to do for his Eagle Scout project, and we said, oh my gosh, we, have, we want to do a garden, and it was, he designed it. Um, we have 11, 11 raised beds. Um, he put up a picket fence, a privacy fence um, in that area just to kind of protect that area for us. And uh, we've, been, um, we've been doing it ever since. The project science students each spring design what the uh, garden will look like, what the beds will contain, and then usually come you know, mid-July, um, with the help of community and families uh, that come in weekly to help maintain our garden. And then um, late July, we usually start our farmer's market where we uh, take all of our produce. Um, we've even partnered with um, the village market who gives any of their um, extra produce um, for the day. And we bring it out and we give it back to the community uh, free of charge. Uh, we take donations, it usually is enough to cover the next year's, um, you know, planting um, for that year. So um, it's really, really been amazing. Unfortunately, last year with COVID, uh, put a little damper on things. So we are hoping um, and looking forward to being able to have a garden better than we've ever had. Because um, as with everyone, there have been, um, this has been a tough year for many. So we're hoping that we have enough produce to be able to um, help all the families that need it. So. That's, that's what we've been doing. Um, one of the things that I talked with Mark about was uh, we do struggle with um, some flooding in some of the area in the back um, where our garden is. And um, this idea of a rain garden to help with that filtration and also being environmentally friendly is something that um, I would love to be able to do. One, because it's aesthetically pleasing and two, um, to be able to be welcoming to other species um, in our courtyard area. Well, um, hopefully next year, I don't know if it's next year or the next year, when we end up having three different uh, courtyards in our, um, at our building, we'll have the garden, we have one courtyard, and then we'll have our new uh, green infrastructure um, that is going to be going in here, which I am looking forward to. So um, I know Mark has been talking a lot about this and I've been learning a lot about these uh, rain gardens and so um, that is what's looking like it's going to go into our new courtyard and so looking forward to um, you know continuing working with students to be able to um, share my passion for um, being environmentally friendly and also teach them some skills that they'll be able to use later on. It, it Thank you. And just, just another little, little uh, the whole idea of the community garden, as well as in Lakeview schools, Carl will talk a little bit about it, but they have a lot of courtyards. So actually got together with Sharon and Sarah uh, for this plan. And this is where we got uh, the plant, the planning plan for uh, the, the, the green infrastructure that's going with the addition. So we're gonna be planting a lot of these uh, uh, plants and then Sharon has offered to help us move some into the into your uh, community garden area to make it look cool for the students and everything else. But uh, a couple of the key things that we have going on with, with the program is we're going to have a, a, a good rain barrel. A lot of the schools, they, they wrestle with rain barrels because it's how, how do you get all that flow off of the gutter from a school into a little barrel? So in Lakeview, we're, we're going to have a design where you, some of the water will go into a barrel, some of it will be bypassed into the swales. But again, the swales are, are designed, there's, there's a lot of, not only grass, but there's a lot of filter media in here so that before the water will go through the, the soil, it will filter out a lot of the chemicals and, and the bad stuff instead of putting in underground tanks. And, and maybe uh, uh, Paulson, or, uh, Superintendent Paulson would maybe talk about some of the other schools and what they're doing. So. Look at that picture. Ten thousand eight. <laughs> Get that off the website, huh? <laughs> so if you in concept, we have buildings with five hundred thousand square feet of roof and probably another two hundred and fifty thousand square feet of parking lots and sidewalks. So 
as I've had you know great teachers like Lisa Beckman and her partner doing these projects with kids and encouraging those, having Green School, um, Macomb County running a Green School program and having all of our schools participate, and I think Jefferson just being a 13-year award for that, we would we got into some bond design work and, and building new additions to our buildings, re constructing parking lots and some of the sidewalks and driveways. And so when that was starting to be discussed, Mark and I ran into each other and started asking some questions about, we can be not only a participant in doing good things to save the lake, but also be an educational tool at the same time. So the kiosks that you know, Councilman Rebella was talking about will show up in those rain gardens that we're going to have adjacent to our parking lots and adjacent to the driveways that we're, we're putting in and redesigning. So it's, good, it's a big effort. We're going to do it probably at all of our facilities when, the, when this is done in three or four years. But this year, starting at Jefferson, probably we've driven by a little back, seen the, the work going on there. We'll have some more work at Harmon and Greenwood Elementary Schools and Ardmore and Princeton Elementary Schools. This summer, you'll see the Greenwood and Harmon work happening. And those designs of those drainage swales are meant to, again, clean up that water before it hits the storms. Um, and you know, when you have those large parking lot areas and sidewalks, if you can do something to take that water and push it into those areas, so we're you know, building, the, building the infrastructure with that purpose behind it. Um, you know, and I credit, when you have architects that don't know a lot about it or don't think a lot about it, and you start asking them and they don't come up with a good answer and you have an expert like this in your community who's a former parent said both of you others are too um, and you start to say maybe you can help our architect get this right so it's easy when you're the one in charge to pull that off and i'm happy to you know be an organization in the city one of the biggest probably in the city to model that to put educational facilities in place, use those swales with the kids, and be able to talk about it so that we're preparing the next generation to show up at the Nautical Coast cleanup, and you know, although we've had lots of kids participate over the years, and we push those dates out on our internal communications too. So Lakeview's happy to be a supporter, happy to participate in the design and improvement of those too, because, what's the phrase? Oh. Uh, and when you drive by Jefferson, you'll see they got this little this little cut right right in the middle. They're preparing for a, a, a swale. And the best part about it, I always say, it's like instead of an underground tank where the water just goes into the tank and then it overflows with contaminants to the lake, it's going to go through the grass, filter out those those contaminants, and it's cost effective too because they don't have to maintain that big tank anymore. So. That's kind of what we got with that. And then we're going to move on to another thing with the program. Uh, come on up, Paul. Uh, you know, we're trying to mesh what we're doing with the city, like these kiosks. Dave Rebello, we're going to put all these kiosks and that program. We're going to harness all this information together. But, but also, there's a tree program. So Lakeview is going to be getting some free trees from the DPW. And it's just a hand in hand working together. And I've, I've, I've lined areas up with Paul where we're gonna do it after the construction, it's gonna look really nice when we're said and done. You talk about the program now. Sure, yes, uh, I'd like to thank Mark and everyone else with the environmental, uh, Waterfront Environmental Community to have us here today uh, so we can you know, discuss a little bit what we do at the DPW uh, when it comes to uh, trees. Um, over the last six years, we've taken uh, $300,000 in, in grant money and we've been able to plant 1,667 trees with that money throughout the city. Um, we just recently, uh, most recently finished planting 510 trees with our most recent GLRI grant. Um, the GLRI is, uh, stands for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Oh, yeah. Is that there? better? Is that better? <laughs> um, it stands for the Great Lakes Restor uh, Restoration Initiative, and that's a grant uh, funded through the U.S. Agriculture uh, Forestry Department and the EPA 
to uh, use forestry conservation to kind of help improve the Great Lakes. Um, in addition to the GLR, GLRI tree plantings, uh, we've also participated participated in the Green Macomb Initiative. Uh, this initiative was started um, to you know, raise awareness about increasing the tree canopy throughout South of Macomb. Um, the, uh, currently, the Macomb, Southern Macomb County has about 33% uh, tree canopy. Here in St. Clair Shores, we're sitting at about 17 to 20% tree, uh, tree canopy. And we'd really like to see that come up over that 30% mark for the tree canopy. Um, increased tree canopy, you know, the more tree canopy they say you have, uh, it helps to increase home values, improve uh, physical and mental health of the residents, promote the use of public spaces, save energy, and reduce pollution. Um, you may be wondering how forest uh, conservation is going to help, you know, with the Great Lakes and Lake St. Clair here most importantly. And that's pretty easy to explain because, um, as we've already discussed, stopping that rainwater from getting to the lake and trying to purify it before it gets there it goes a long way. Um, these new trees, that once we get them planted, uh, we pr uh, predict that they're going to absorb about 3,334,000 gallons of rainwater annually. Um, with that, that's going to help reduce the pollution and sediment going into Lake St. Clair. It's also going to help reduce the pl uh, flooding issues that we have when we get a big rainfall. And in addition to that, it's also going to help reduce that water that's going into the uh, retention basins that, you know, for the treatment and retention basins. And the less we can put water into there, the less they're going to have to pump it into the lake, you know, in a big rainstorm. Um, even though we've planted those 1,667 trees, um, that's still, a, they say you need about 2,235 trees in order to increase that tree canopy by only half a percent. So we're still way behind where we'd like to be with tree planting. And that's where the community involvement comes in. Um, like Mark said, uh, we, each year we do an Arbor Day tree planting where we like to pick a local school to go there and plant you know, a couple trees uh, with a second grade class to kind of inform them about the importance of the environment, and what trees can do for their environment. And so that's where we like to you know, try to work with Mark and other organizations here to kind of you know, get that involvement and increase throughout the city. So if anyone would like a tree, <laughs> we do have back there. Um, I did bring a couple of our tree selection forms. You can purchase a tree through the city. and Our DPW will plant it either in the spring or fall for you. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, like to point out the Green Macomb Initiative. Um, they do also offer a tree sale every year. Uh, you can find more information on that at green.macomb.gov or I'm sorry, uh, .org. <laughs> and uh, you can order them, the trees through there and they ship it to your home. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Well, Appreciate that. Friend. Yeah. And again, just working with the community is key. Again, Joe, you have the. Uh, where did Joe go? Is he? All right. But Joe's taught us a lot about outreach to the community, but you got to outreach to everybody. We're the Waterfront Environmental Committee. We've talked a lot about green infrastructure, how we're gonna treat the groundwater, but hey, we love the lake, and that's most important to us, so Bill's gonna talk a little bit of how we're helping the lake. Thank you. How many have been out to Veterans Memorial Beach in the last couple months? Okay, so a couple, but um, I just wanted to go over a project that uh, Mayor and Council graciously we took on together and we, we looked at, I don't know if everyone can see, but the erosion that was taking place over at the beach was quite substantial, especially with the high water in 2019 and 2020. You can see here it's creeping up to the path. Um, go to the next slide. And actually, this was a problem even before the high water. We lost 90 feet of beach over the last 20 years. That's a Google Earth image from 2000, 2001, and then you, you see this is what it used to be and then what it was. So we started working with our engineers to kind of to come up with something to, to help mitigate and stop this erosion from continuing. Um, this one was by HRC. We started looking at something that would be, we have an ordinary high water mark with both the Army Corps of Engineers and Eagle, and we wanted to be above that so that we didn't have to get a joint permit, and we wanted something that wouldn't necessarily be that permanent, that we could put something in to stop the erosion, but we could move it later if needed. So this was kind of the plan we started working with. We looked at the projections, and as you can see, the last two years, 
we really don't have a, you know, it's a, a, a wide range of where the water levels can be. I don't know, you can't see, but 2019 was the high of that red line, which was the highest water level at Lake St. Clair. And we planned to do this intervention during a time when water level could be the lowest, so February, March. That's why we targeted doing this at those times. So we were looking at, and you can see the, the beach receded quite a bit like, it, like we thought it would. We actually had to, in 2019, it was so bad in this corner, we had to put concrete cloth, an intervention, you can see here, to save that tree. It was getting right into the corner and really hollowing out that area. And you can see kind of the, where the water was. So we, we worked with, um, with ECT and came up with a plan that was um, to put in limestone above that high water mark. And here you can see kind of the project. There's a, a concrete, uh, aggregate base with um, a geotextile wrap around it, which is what these, uh, these limestone boulders sit on. It's a, they're each about four to 6,000 pounds each, so they're very heavy. And then actually these are about three inches. When the waters, the ordinary high water marks about three inches below that rock but there's actually fabric behind the rock. So even when the waves kick up during a storm, it's gonna catch it, the, it's not gonna let the, the, set, the sand go through the rock and further erode. So it's just something to kind of stop that erosion that was going on there. This is the final product, if you guys go out there. It's kind of a cleaner beach. They're really The beach really wasn't much of a beach the last couple of years, so this is a way to kind of start um, saving it, and then, like I said, it's flexible enough that we can, as the ordinary high water mark changes, we can maybe move those rocks out. But um, I encourage you to go take a look um, and enjoy the beach this summer. Maybe set up a lawn chair out here and get some sun. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, everyone. As a fellow engineer, I think this is a great idea. Just the best thing I love about it is just what Bill said, you know, coming up with a flexible design that, hey, it, you, it can be modified. It's not a permanent. That's what's great about green infrastructure and everything that we're doing. I know Sharon's going to kill me because she doesn't like grass, but whenever you have green infrastructure, green gardens, you got to plant them so, hey, if, if something happens and you got to let them grow in a little bit, you can. But then you could plant more, more flowers and let them grow, and as they grow, your, your lawn can shrink, so it really works well together. Uh, come on up, Heidi, talk about the scholarship program, but even before you do that, I just want to give a kudos out to Peter. Uh, Peter's uh, Heidi's wife, and he's run the monofilament program for many years, right? But, but Henry Bowman's taken that over, and he says he's doing a great job there, too. So thank you, Henry, again. Go ahead, Heidi. Historically, we've always presented the students with their scholarship at our um, annual meeting, which would be today. But this year, because of COVID, we've given the applicants additional time to apply for the scholarships. The due date for the applications is this coming Monday, April 26th at 4 o'clock at the city clerk's office. Right, Jake? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get your application. <laughs> Since 2007, we've been able to give, where's my drum roll, $20,000 in scholarships. $20,000? Yes. To 40 students. There was one student from De La Salle, one student from University of Liggett, three students from Regina, 10 from Lakeview, 11 from South Lake, and 14 from Lakeshore. Uh, we've been very fortunate to be able to have very generous donors who can offer $500 scholarships to high school seniors who live in Sinclair Shores and or go to school in Sinclair Shores. The students must participate in one of the projects 
of the Waterfront Environmental Committee and also answer several environmental questions. So you still have a chance this Sunday with Sarah with the Mini Beach Club. So if you know of any seniors who could apply, there's applications on the tables. Back in 2007, when scholarships were first awarded, Tom Cleaver and the We Are Here Foundation were the only sponsors. Is Tom here today? No? Okay. Well, he's been a great supporter of this committee and uh, he would contribute all of the scholarship funding for quite a few years. And even computers. And computers, laptops, yes. We have grown and we have received generous donations from a number of individuals and groups through the years. This year's, I think Erin mentioned, our scholarship donors this year are State Representative Kevin Hertel, Anthony and Daniel Cuvier, the St. Clair Shores Lions, and the Lock St. Clair Kiwanis Club all feel that the environment is important and we are privileged to have them as supporters who wish to encourage young people to be involved in the environment and volunteer. Thank you. And we're just wrapping it up here, so hold on to your seats. We just want to make sure everybody realizes we have the rain barrels at the DPW. They're great, easy to get. You have to go down to City Hall and you purchase one for $58.30. That's good. Matter of fact, this is uh, South Lake High School here. Uh, this is Gail. She's got a rain, a rain barrel in, in the school to help educate the students. And actually, this is a rain barrel here back at Ardmore Elementary. So we're going to, they're going to have a new program going up. But the biggest thing is these drums might need a little bit of help and if you ever have any help or you need any help just give us a call and we will be glad to help you out put these in so and as of last year you can get multiple colors too not just the orange Ooh. oh yeah and, and and i forgot to mention back on those scholarships we got the saint Clair shores lions club president chuck balestri thanks chuck for coming out And at the end of it, we got volunteers, oper volunteers opportunities. So I actually, the, the mini cleanups are really great. They're, they're not really high packed. They're fun. You can get out, enjoy the weather, do a little cleaning as you go, and everything is great. So thank you, Sarah, for handling that this weekend. So with that, we are done. And again, just on behalf of the whole environmental committee, we are so happy you can all attend. We're so happy we have so much participation with the city and all our programs. Thank you so much to the DPW, to the city, to Parks and Rec. You know, we're in this together to make this a fun family community, like Henry says. So thank you all. Good night. Yay!